And we are doing week two tonight of the new series that we're doing, which is called Why Not Now? And Sidja kicked us off last week with an amazing message all about um, Stephen and how we need to stand up for our faith and just stand tall. And yeah, and I feel like Stephen was like the best example of that. And tonight, I'm going to be speaking about Stephen's friend, actually, and his name is Philip. No, not Philip Kutsia. This is Philip from the Bible. And before we start with this message, I really just want to pray, pray for the evening. Um, yeah. So, dear God, I thank you so much for tonight. I thank you so much that we have the amazing privilege of being able to meet online for online youth, Lord God. I just pray that we... Um, that you just speak through me, Lord Jesus, and I just pray for the hearts behind the screens and that you soften them and prepare them for the word, Lord God. And I pray that we can all leave tonight closer to you, Lord Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. Cool, guys. So the title of my message tonight is Don't Blink. And I don't mean that literally because you physically have to blink. Like you don't have a choice. Like it just happens. And that's not what I mean. But I mean, don't blink as not to hesitate to and miss the opportunity of spreading the word to someone or, or changing the world um, by impacting someone's life with Jesus. And that's what I mean when I say don't blink, because so often we get into this place of comfort where we just, we just are so comfortable with our lives that we forget that the purpose and the reason why we are here is to glorify God and spread the gospel. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, in, cra- in case you didn't know that. Um, and the crazy thing is you can't know about Jesus unless someone tells you. And I was meant to grab my phone but I didn't. So can someone just bring me my phone? Because this is an analogy and I can't do it without my phone. So my phone's just there. Can someone just bring that for me? Thank you so much. Sorry, I should have popped that in my pocket. But um, I've got my phone now for my analogy. But if I, t- okay, I'm going to type you guys a message, all of you, collectively, because that's possible. But I'm just going to say I am anyway. So I'm typing you guys a message. I'm actually typing Christina a message. I'm typing it. Okay. But I don't press send. But you guys got the message, right? I didn't press in, but you still get the message, right? Of course not. I'm not crazy. I know that's not how it works. For me, for you to get a message, or for example, Christine, for Christine to get the message, I actually have to press in. And it's the same with Jesus. We, if, if you want someone to know about Jesus, you have to tell them about Jesus. You need to send the message of Jesus to people in order for them to know them. And in Romans 10 verse 14, it says, But how can people call on him for help if they've not yet believed? And how can they believe in one they've not yet heard of? And how can they hear the message of life if there was no one there to proclaim it? We are called to spread the gospel of Jesus. It's our purpose. And being a good example is important. We need to be a good example and we need to live a life that glorifies God. But our evangelism can't stop there. And I'm a big advocate of spread the gospel and if necessary, use words. And that is important. We need to show people that we love Jesus and in relationship with Jesus with our actions. But our evangelism can't end there. It needs to go further. At a point in our evangelism, we need to speak about Jesus. We need to tell people about Jesus. We need to say the message of who Jesus is. Living a godly life and spreading the good news works together hand in hand. But today we're going to be looking at a man named Philip. But before I get into the story, let me give you some backstory. Philip was living in some really rough times for Christians. All Christians were under persecution and they were being scattered and they were in hiding. But this did not stop Philip. He was fierce. He was fearless as well. And in, if anything, this group of people that Philip belonged to, they actually spread the message more because they were like, this is not going to stop us. We are going to continue. There's nothing that's stopping them today. And Philip actually had a very successful and very big preaching ministry in Samaria. And it leads us to our story. So this is quite a lot of scripture that I'm about to be reading to you. But just bear with me because it's important and it's an amazing and an exciting story. So this is Acts 8, verse 26 to 40. And it says, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gazar. 
So he started out and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was now returning. Seating, seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how can I, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth? That's actually a, like a prophecy in Isaiah about Jesus. But the, let me continue. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and they went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And I love that story so much. For me, it encourages me, it challenges me, and it definitely empowers me when I think about evangelism and spreading the good news of God. And from this story, I just have three practical points on Uh, just for us to take away from the story and for us to apply to our lives and to evangelism. And point number one is be available. Philip made himself available to God. He wasn't focused on his own plan, but made himself available for God to work through him. Philip was leading and he was having, like I said before, he was having a very successful preaching ministry, but that wasn't Philip's focus. Philip's focus wasn't on making this ministry as big as it possibly can be so Philip can be a top dog or like it wasn't on himself or glorifying himself. He, he did all of this to glorify God. And we, and we can so easily get in that frame of mind. I know I did in high school. In high school, and it's so funny because it did not end up that way at all, I was set on studying medicine. I wanted to be a doctor. And from grade eight, literally to the beginning of matric, that was my focus. I studied. Everything that I did was to make this happen. I wanted to be a prefect because of this. I did community service because of this. And everything I did, it was just focused on this. I didn't go out as much because I was like so set on studying medicine. And literally everything that I wanted, I just focused on what was next. I focused on what I needed to accomplish. I focused on being a prefect. I focused on getting good grades and just everything that I could do to do this. And there was always something. I never slowed down. I never stopped and asked God, is this your plan? Because it actually wasn't five years later. I, I realized that now, but I never stopped and asked God, is this your will? I was so focused on my own will that I wasn't available to do God's will. And it's so easy to do this. And in Proverbs 16 verse 1, it says, Go ahead and make all the plans you want, but it's the Lord who will ultimately direct your steps. And I love that scripture so much. In doing God's will, there needs to be a partnership with us <laughs> carrying it out and, us, and, and God's control and seeking His will. He wants us to use our minds and he wants us to plan, but he wants us to seek his will in our plans. Part of our plan, we always need to factor this in, is doing God's work and spreading his word. Like I said before, that's our purpose. We're called, Jesus' last words to us was to spread the word. That is our purpose. There needs to be space in our life for God to use us. I love this. Being available is an intentional act. We don't just one day wake up and be available. We need to choose to be available. It's a choice. It's a choice to surrender our lives to Him. It's a choice to sur- to, for God to lead us. That's a choice that we make. To say to God, these are, my des- these are my desires. These are the plans that I want. But God, you are my priority. Your will is my priority. And that's a choice that we make. And the why reveals our heart. For example, if you're saying, I want to be a prefect, what is your why? Is it because you want to be 
popular in your school? Is it because you want a good ap application for university? Or is it because you want to be a good, godly influence in your school? Or because you want to be in a place of leadership to lead people and lead people to Jesus? It's the why behind it. And the crazy thing is, and I was actually thinking about this today, and I didn't write it down, but like we can have these desires in our hearts, and we can be so nervous that God's going to like do something completely opposite. Like I know someone who is like, I'm so scared that God is going to send me into the middle of nowhere to like a missions in Zambia. But I'm like, if that's not what God's gifted you with, if you don't have the gifts to do that or the talents or even the desire, I don't think God's going to say, God created you. He knows your gifts. He knows your talents. And he's going to use that to glorify him. So we don't need to worry that God's going to do something completely different with our lives because God created you. He knows your heart. He knows your, um, he knows your desires. We need to be available for him to use us in our schools. We are in, you're in your school, you're in your family, or you're in your friend group for a purpose to fulfill God's purpose. You're not there by an accident. God placed you in your school, in your friend group, in your family, all for a reason. That can be, you can find yourself frustrated in those places with those people, but God's put you there for a reason, to be a light, to be available for him to use you. And this brings me to my second point, be courageous. Philip was so brave and he was so courageous because in the time Christians were being persecuted, but he was having none of that. He was like, nothing stopping me. I will continue. I will press on and I will still spread the gospel. He spread the gospel even more during this time. And I just find that amazing because I don't know if you guys, but sometimes when you feel like life's going bad, the last thing you want to have to do is speak about Jesus to people and be excited and be joyful. But when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what comes with us. It comes with that joy in suffering. And we see that so clearly in Philip's life. And I've been in high school before. I'm not that old. I was there like five years ago. I was in high school and I know speaking about Jesus isn't, isn't easy. I know it's something that is difficult. I went to a Catholic school, still hard there. And I'm sure if you're in a Christian school, it's still going to be difficult there. But it takes courage to step out in high school and speak out about our faith and about Jesus. And I know that inviting someone to youth can be scary. But in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, it says, For God will never give you a spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit, He gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. I love that scripture. That fear that we get, that nervousness, that, that anxious when we decide to invite someone to church or speak to them about Jesus. That's not from God. That's from the enemy because he doesn't, want, he doesn't want the kingdom of God to grow. He doesn't want the church to grow. That's not what he wants. God gives us the Holy Spirit, which gives us power, love, and self-control. I love that. We don't have to do this alone. We have God on our side. We have the Holy Spirit with us when we go and evangelize. We, can tr we don't have to trust in our own power. We trust in God's power in who he is. And you know what? And I was just thinking about this today as well. I know it's awkward. I know it's embarrassing. We think the worst situation in our head when we go and we decide that we're going to invite someone. But literally, the worst thing that can happen is for them to say no. No, I don't want to come to church. No, I actually don't want to hear about Jesus. No, I don't want you to pray for me. That is literally the worst thing that can happen. But the best thing that can happen is that person's life changes. The best thing that can happen is for them to get into a relationship with God, spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. That's literally the best. And the worst thing is just for them to say no. I know it's difficult to realize because that wasn't my thoughts. That wasn't my mindset when I was in high school. But realizing now, I'm telling you, that's the worst thing that can happen. And I was so scared and I was so focused on doing other things that only in matric did I start inviting people and the person that I invited in my church, she's now a worship leader in another church and it's because I have that confidence that the worst thing that can happen is to say them say no but the best thing is for them to be evangelizing in another community being a worship leader for another church and that's the mindset we need to have we need to have that forward thinking and not that that nervousness and that fear God doesn't give us that spirit of fear we are called to plant seeds in people's lives. That's what God calls us to do. That's inviting them to youth. That's speaking to them about Jesus. That is living a godly life. That's asking people if they want prayer. It's planting those seeds. And all we need to do is plant seeds and be obedient to God's calling. And God literally does the rest. God does the watering. God does the harvest. We just need to plant the seeds and be obedient with that. And that brings me to my third and last point. So number one, be available. Number two, be courageous. And number three, be 
be obedient. And this is my favorite one. Philip was obedient right from the beginning of the story, and he continually said yes to God without knowing the outcome. We see in the beginning, he left his big preaching ministry to go South Desert Road. I don't think that was in Philip's plan, but he was obedient to God. He was obedient to God when he said, run, run and run by the carriage. He stepped, he continually said yes to God and he didn't know the outcome. He was just obedient. Philip knew what God had called him to do and he didn't need affirmation from anyone else. He didn't need affirmation from his friends. He didn't need affirmation from anyone. He knew what God had called him to do and he was obedient to that calling. And he was obedient in this, what may have seemed a small way, but extraordinary acts of God comes from ordinary it comes from ordinary acts of obedience. Extraordinary, extraordinary acts of God comes from ordinary acts of obedience. I clearly can't get that line right. Your job is not to worry about the outcome. Your job is to simply step out and watch as God shapes the outcome. The outcome isn't, isn't us. It's not our responsibility. It's not in our hands. That's in God's control. We just need to say yes to God. We need to step out and be obedient. And I'm going to share a story with you literally about this that happened about two months ago, about a month ago. I was sitting in my quiet time and I was praying and I was talking to God and all of a sudden he put a person on my heart and it was someone that I went to school with, someone I wasn't close with. We were in school from grade one to matric, but I didn't really have a relationship with her. I hadn't spoken to her in four years and God was like, you need to message her the scripture and you need to tell her that I love her and you need to do this. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to do that, God. I was like, I just don't think I have that kind of, I don't know, I don't have that courage. I just don't think I have that kind of confidence to speak to someone that I hadn't spoken to in four years. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm just being crazy. Um, I just maybe saw an Instagram story. That's why she's on my mind, not God's voice. The next day, sitting, having my quiet time with God. And do you want to know who popped in my head? The same girl. And God told me the same thing. And I was like, I was like, I really, really don't want to do this. Like, I really, I, I just don't. Like, this is something I really don't want to do. Didn't do it. The next day, and I was like, you know what, God, this is clearly from you. I'm going to do it. And I messaged her and I was like, hey, this is a bit random. But I was praying and God put you on my heart. And I sent her a scripture and I encouraged her. And I was like, you know what, God loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you're going through, God still loves you. And can I tell you the crazy thing? She sent me like a two-minute voice note telling me how much she needed that message. She was like, you have no idea what is going on. But that message was exactly what she needed that day. And you know what? She could have gotten that earlier if I was just obedient to God and not thinking about myself. If I was just obedient to God, she could have gotten that earlier. She was like, you don't understand how much I needed to hear that. She's like, my life is so bad right now, but that message is exactly what I needed to hear. And a week later, I was like, that's amazing. God is so good. I was like, if you need prayer, just, just message me. A week later, her mom was going in for an operation. She was like, hey, can you please pray for me? And in about two weeks later, um, Jean-Marie, Phil's wife, um, she was also at school with us. And I posted a photo of them on Instagram during the lobby. She's like, where can I watch this? And then she saw another girl of, of, uh, from our school also <laughs> again doing something. She's like, where can I find this? And that's because I was obedient. And you know what? I'm going to tell you the hard truth. I messaged her about a week ago and I invited her to church and, and she just read it and didn't respond. But I was obedient to God. And the outcome's not in my hands, but I need to trust in what God's calling me to do, trust in what he's telling me to do and just be obedient because we're not always going to get the exciting response. Sometimes we are going to get the no or we're going to get the blue ticks. Being in youth ministry, you get blue ticks a lot. I'm telling you guys, some of you blue tick me and I'll, I'll tell you that. But you know what? It's not about the outcome. It's about being obedient to what God's putting on your heart to do. And we don't always get the great testimony out of it. But you know what? We're planting seeds and we're planting those seeds and God will bring a harvest to those seeds. And in Romans 8 verse 14, it says, The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. We need to be moved by the impulses. We need to act on the Holy Spirit. When He moves in our heart, we need to act on that. We can't ignore the Holy Spirit. I did it and I was silly. I should have messaged her straight away. And now I do that. Whenever God puts someone in my heart, I'm like, I was praying for you. Do you know how much people love it when you tell them they're praying for you? I've never told someone that I'm praying for them and then be like, don't do that. 
they're always like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And these are all people that are extremely far from God. Even if you do that, it warms them up to the idea. I was just praying for you. God just put, just, God just put you on my heart. People love hearing that. And it was crazy. I was just thinking about this as well. I was thinking about the person who was obedient in asking me to church, the person that was obedient to God, and that changed my entire life. I, I was thinking today, I was like, God, your grace is amazing because what happens if they didn't? My, my entire life was, was different, and I'm not over-exaggerating. I work at the church. I've devoted my life to doing God's work. If that person didn't invite me, and I really believe that God would have brought me in another way, but how crazy that because that person was obedient to the Holy Spirit, all my best friends, I met at church. My mentors, I met at church. So many things have happened because I'm in church, I'm in God's house, and I'm serving Him. And that was because one person was obedient to the Holy Spirit inviting me to... Invite, encouraging me to invite Jesus into my life. And I want you to think about your life. I'm going to think about who invited you. How would your life be different if that person wasn't obedient?